is a poor source of vitamin D. Where do you get your vitamin D from? Basically, as we just discussed above, that it is major, majorly synthesized endogenously in the skin when your UVB rays falls on them. But from your diet, also you can get what? You can get ergo calciferol, which is from plant source. So a lot of your ergots, they give you ergo calciferol. And you can also get cole calciferol, which is from your animal source. Animal source, okay? Your fish. Now what happens? Your ergo calciferol and your cole calciferol is the only difference between the two, as you can see here is in the presence of this double bond and this extra methyl, okay? So that is the only difference. You see, the double bond is missing here and that extra methyl is missing here. So your ergo calciferol is also changed into cholate calciferol. Okay, so in your blood, what are you getting? You are getting cholate calciferol either from animal sources and from plant sources, your ergo calciferol is also changed into, this is also changed into polycalciferol and from synthesis in the skin you are also getting polycalciferol so ultimately what are you getting in your blood you are getting polycalciferol so that is what you're getting ultimately in the blood so free from vitamin d is required only in individuals with limited exposure to sunlight so majorly the synthesis is taking place in the skin when exposed to sunlight so you need to take it through diet only when you have limited exposure to sunlight, okay? So that was about the sources of vitamin D. So what were the sources? Repeating it, it was one was endogenous source, that is synthesis in the skin, and the other was, which is the major source, and the other was through diet from animal sources like fish and from plant sources like some ergots, they give you ergo calciferol, okay? Now moving forward to the metabolism of vitamin D. Now, through diet, which is very less amount, like I told you, or through endogenous synthesis, we have polycalciferol inside our blood. So, ultimately, you have polycalciferol inside your blood. Now, with the help of transport protein, vitamin, and what is the name of the transport protein? That is vitamin D binding protein. Polycalciferol reaches liver. Why do you need transport proteins? Because your vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. It is a fat-soluble vitamin and not a water-soluble vitamin. Okay? So, for the transport of vitamin D, you will be needing your transport protein. And what is that transport protein? That is vitamin D binding protein. So, why, with the help of vitamin D binding transport protein, your cholecalciferol from the blood, it reaches where it re reaches liver. Now, what happens is that your cholecalciferol, it is not the active form. It is not the active form of vitamin D. So, you need to convert it into its active form. So, for that, we need to, under, for that, it needs to undergo hydroxylation. It needs to undergo hydroxylation reactions, okay? Now, the first hydroxylation reaction will take place in the liver by the enzyme 25-hydroxylase. So, the enzyme 25-hydroxylase is hydroxylates polycalciferol at the 25th position and it becomes 25-hydroxy polycalciferol. So, this is the first hydroxylase hydroxylation of polycalciferol taking place in the liver at the 25th position with the help of the enzyme 25 hydroxylase okay now see this polycalciferol which you see here this polycalciferol it has one hydroxyl group okay therefore it is also known as calciol okay now what happens it already has one hydroxyl group now after now, after your 25th hydroxylation, that is at the 25th position, a hydroxyl is being added 
what happens? It becomes calcidiol. Obviously, because it already had one hydroxyl group. So you're adding another hydroxyl group at the 25th position. So you have two hydroxyl groups now. So it becomes calcidiol, okay? So your cholecalciferol, which was transported with the help of the transport protein, it reaches liver and in the liver what happens? Your calciol, it changes into calcidiol. Now this calcidiol is again not the active form of vitamin D. Now what happens from the liver, it is transported to the kidneys where one more hydroxylation reaction takes place. So you see one more hydroxylation, the another hydroxylation reaction is taking place in the kidneys. Okay, So in the kidneys, another hydroxylation reaction takes place and the enzyme involved is 1-alpha hydroxylase. So with the help of 1-alpha hydroxylase in the kidneys, there is second hydroxylation taking place. So it already had two hydroxyl groups. Now a third hydroxyl group is being added at position one. So it will become from calcidiol, it will convert into calcitriol. So calcidiol now it becomes calcitriol. And what is calcitriol? It is 125 dihydroxy polycalciferol. Okay. And this enzyme which is bringing about this. Uh, hydroxylation in the kidney that is one alpha hydroxylase and this one alpha hydroxylase it is favored its activity is enhanced by parathyroid hormone and it is considered as the weight limiting enzyme and this calcitriol is the biologically active form of vitamin d okay let's understand this with the help of a diagram so this is your skin so your endogenously synthesized vitamin D in the skin, what happens? This intermediate 7 dehydrocholesterol in the skin, it is converted when ultraviolet white in the UVB region, ultraviolet rays falls, then a series of isomerization, photoisomerization reactions take place and your 7 dehydrocholesterol, it changes into polycalciferol. So this is the major source of polycalciferol in your blood. Apart from that, Minor source being through diet, okay? Your animal source being of polycalciferol being fish, major. And uh, otherwise, your food is always a poor source of vitamin D unless fortified. And certain plant sources like ergots, they give you ergo polycalciferol, okay? Which again changes into polycalciferol. Now, ultimately, what is the net result that you have polycalciferol in your blood? Now, this cholecalciferol with the help of transport proteins, this cholecalciferol in blood with the help of transport proteins, it reaches where? It reaches your liver. Okay, this is your liver. It reaches liver. Now, in the liver, what is happening? Twin, with the help of the enzyme 25 hydroxylase hydroxylation reaction is taking place at the position 25. So this cholecalciferol, it is changed into 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. And your calciferol is also, also known as calciol. So when you have, and it is having, already having one hydroxyl, okay? So what happens? When you add another hydroxyl at carbon 25, it becomes calcidiol, okay? Now, this calcidiol is still not the active form of vitamin D. What happens? This calcidiol now reaches the kidney. Now, this calcidiol has reached the kidney and in the kidney, what is happening? This calcidiol, which is 25-hydroxy polycalciferol, it is undergoing another hydroxylation reaction via, via the enzyme. 1-alpha hydroxylase to form what? Calcitriol. And this calcitriol is 125-dihydroxy cholecalciferol. This is the active form of vitamin D. Okay? And this 1-alpha hydroxylase, which is bringing about this hydroxylation in the kidney, this is favored by parathyroid hormone. Okay? So that was the entire metabolism of your vitamin D from how from uh, starting from the source that how you are getting it into your blood and from uh, uh, reaching up to its metabolism 
until we get its active form. So you have received the active form of vitamin D. Now let's see what happens. When the body does not require vitamin D, it is converted into its inactive form by 24 hydroxylation. So your 24 hydroxylation, that is hydroxylation at the 24 position will convert your active vitamin D into inactive vitamin D. So your vitamin D is inactivated by 24 hydroxylation. Okay. So in the kidney, 24 hydroxylation forms calcium tetrol. So in the kidney, you are getting calcium tetrol. So this was your kidney. So in the kidney, you had calcium triol. Now by 24 hydroxylation, what will happen? You will have it already had three hydroxyl. Now another hydroxyl is being added at 24 position. So what will happen? It will become calcium tetrol. That is, it has four hydroxyl groups, and this is inactive vitamin D because of 24th hydroxylation. So hydroxylation at the 24th position will lead to the formation of inactive vitamin D. And in the liver, 24 hydroxylation will form 24 hydroxy calcidiol because in the liver we have calcidiol. So it has two hydroxyl group. When you add another at the 24th position, it becomes 24 hydroxy calcidiol. Okay, this is also inactive vitamin D. So a uh, recapitulation what is your calciol? It is cholecalciferol simply. What is your calcidiol? Calcidiol is 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. What is calcitriol? It is 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. And this is the only biologically active vitamin D. Then what is calcitetrol? It is formed after 24th hydroxylation of calcitriol. Okay, and this is inactive vitamin D. Now let's take in MCQ. It says active form of vitamin D is cholecalciferol. No, it is not the active form. 24, the moment you see 24 here, you know, no, this is the inactive form. Okay. 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, that is cholecalciferol. Yes, this is your calcitriol. This is your active form of vitamin D. 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. No, it has only one hydroxylation. It is calcidiol, and calcidiol is not the active form. So, your correct answer here is this. Okay. So, that was about the metabolism. Now, moving on to the functions of vitamin D. So, what is the function of vitamin D? Regulation of calcium and phosphorus. This is the most important function of vitamin D that is regulation of calcium and phosphorus therefore because of this it is involved in bone and teeth development Then it has immunomodulatory functions. It has anti-proliferative role. During bone development, vitamin D helps in mineralization, bone mineralization, okay? So these are the functions of vitamin D. Let's take them in detail. So for regulation of calcium and phosphorus, there are three factors in the body that are responsible for the calcium levels in the body. What are those three factors? One is vitamin D, the other is parathyroid hormone and the third one is calcitonin. So a combination of these three factors, they are responsible for the maintenance of calcium level in your body. And what are the sites where calcium regulation takes place? It is intestine, kidney and bones. So these are the three major sites where your calcium regulation is taking place and the three major factors that bring about this regulation 
it is vitamin D, parathyroid hormone and your calcitonin. Now regulation, the action of these three factors, what is it? Your calcitriol, that is your vitamin D. It increases serum calcium, okay? So it increases serum calcium and it also increases serum phosphorus. Now your parathyroid hormone, it increases serum calcium but it decreases serum phosphorus. <coughs> Excuse me. And your calcitonin, it in decreases serum calcium. Now the name calcitonin, from the name I'll just give you an So, what does it say about hydroxylase? Think about the Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, again some network issue. I'll repeat myself from here. So I was talking about calcitonin. So cal calcitonin, you can remember that it is tonic for the bone. So tonic for the bone means your calcium, all the calcium will be present inside inside the bone, okay? So, obviously, when all the calcium is present inside the bone, it leads to decrease in serum calcium. Now, moving on to the action of vitamin D and parathyroid hormone in intestine. So, your parathyroid hormone, it favors alpha-1 hydroxylase. So, what was alpha-1 hydroxylase? It was involved in hydroxylation at position 1. So, this uh, parathyroid hormone is favoring alpha-1 hydroxylase, which means it is favoring the formation of calcitriol, that is, the formation of active form of vitamin D. So, your parathyroid hormone favors alpha-1 hydroxylase, which in turn favors the level of active vitamin D. So, calcitriol level is increasing. So, indirectly, your parathyroid hormone 
is increasing your calcium triol level. Now your active vitamin D level is increasing. Now what happens? This increases the level of a particular calcium transport channel and a calcium binding protein. So this calcium binding protein ultimately leads to increased absorption of calcium from intestine. So what is happening and what is the mode of action of uh, vitamin D, active vitamin D calcium triol? It, it works like a steroid hormone. Your calcium triol when parathyroid hormone will favor alpha-1 hydro your calcium triol level will increase. As your calcium and as your steroid hormones by binding to nuclear receptors. After binding to nuclear receptors, they are activated and then they bind to on the gene, which ultimately leads to increased expression of this calcium binding protein, which is known as calbindin 9K. Okay, so calbindin 9K ultimately helps in increased absorption of calcium from the intestine. So this is how your vitamin D and parathyroid hormone in the intestine is ultimately leading to increased absorption of calcium from the intestine. Now, the second action of vitamin D in the kidney, in the kidney, your calcium triol increases reabsorption of calcium and phosphorus. So, it is on one hand, your vitamin D is preventing the losses by increasing reabsorption of calcium and phosphorus in the kidney and also it increases absorption of calcium from the intestine. But your parathyroid hormone, its effect in the kidney, your parathyroid hormone favors calcium reabsorption but causes phosphorus excretion. Therefore, it said your parathyroid hormone decreases serum phosphorus level here, it says, okay, because it is causing excretion and not absorption of calcium in the kidneys. Thus, as a result of parathyroid hormone, there is increased serum calcium and it decreases serum phosphorus. Now, moving to the action of vitamin D and parathyroid hormones in bones. So, your vitamin D and parathyroid hormones in bones, they have the same effect. They have same action. Both your parathyroid hormone and vitamin D have the same action in the bones. Now your osteoblast, they have a rank ligand. What is osteoblast? They are the bone forming cells. <coughs> and the receptor for this rank ligand is in pro-osteoclast. Okay. <coughs> now let's consider this is your osteoblast and it says this osteoblast <coughs> it has a ligand by the name of rank rank ligand and then it says that for this ligand the receptor is present in pro osteoclast okay now let's pause. <coughs> this is pro osteoclast and the receptor. This is the receptor. Or rank. Okay. So what happens? Your vitamin D and parathyroid hormone increases the action of rank ligand. So your vitamin D and parathyroid will increase the action of this rank. And when this rank binds to this receptor, what happens? Your pro osteoclast it changes into mature osteoclast okay so you can understand this with the diagram that i have given you let's read what it says so this favors conversion of pro osteoclast into mature osteoclast and your mature osteoclast binds to bones and leads to bone resorption 
Now this mature osteoclast formed. Let's suppose this is the mature osteoclast. Okay. Now this mature osteoclast, this is going to bind to bones. Okay, this is going to bind to bones and it will lead to bone resorption. Okay, thus vitamin D and parathyroid hormone increases serum calcium by increasing osteoclast activity which causes bone resorption. So when there will be bone resorption, calcium will be taken out from the bone. So obviously, just, it will lead to increase in serum calcium levels, okay? Because your osteoclast activity has been increased. So this is the action of vitamin D and parathyroid hormones in the bone. What was happening? Your vitamin D and parathyroid hormone was it was increasing the activity of this rank ligand present in osteoblast, okay? As a result of which, the pro-osteoclast is converted into mature osteoclast and then this mature osteoclast it binds to bones and lead to bone resorption now action of calcitonin in bones so calcitonin it decreases serum calcium by increasing osteoblast activity okay because it will lead to deposition of calcium inside the bones therefore which will cause decrease in serum calcium now let's talk about the immunomodulatory action of vitamin d so antibacterial action of vitamin D can be seen in prevention of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So you can appreciate the antibacterial action of vitamin D by taking the example of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So apart from kidneys, now in the kidneys we knew that alpha-1 hydroxylase were working and there was hydroxylation taking place at the first position but apart from kidneys little amount of hydroxylation that is conversion of calcidiol to calcitriol the alpha 1 hydroxylation is taking place in macrophages as well and this is brought about by cytochrome 27b so the level of calcitriol is also increasing inside the macrophages so when mycobacterium tuberculosis it binds to toll-like receptors on macrophages. It increases the activity of cytochrome 27B. And what is cytochrome 27B doing? It is converting calcidiol into calcitriol. So the increased level of calcitriol inside macrophages, it favors production of catholicidin. And what is catholicidin? It has antimicrobial peptides and they belong to defense and family. So this catholicidin ultimately kills the bacteria. And this is how we can see the immunomodulatory action of vitamin D. If you don't understand this, I will explain you this with the help of a diagram. See, let's suppose this is a macrophage, okay? This is a macrophage and this macrophage on its surface, it has toll-like receptors. What are these toll-like receptors and all the different kinds of receptors? You will study about them in your path 4. But for now, just know that there are receptors present on the surface of macrophages which are able to recognize parts of your pathogens. Okay. So what happens? When these toll-like receptors show Mycobacterium tuberculosis comes and binds. So this is your tall like receptor and to this binds Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay. Now what happens? Your calci Diol is changing into calcitriol. How? 
when this binds to toll like receptors they activate what they activate a cytochrome 27b which activates hydroxylation and of calcidiol into calcitriol and this calcitriol this activates catholicidin and this catholicidin kills the bacteria okay so you can understand this with the help of a diagram now moving on to vitamin d deficiency now vitamin d deficiency it causes demineralization of bones leading to rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults okay so there is decreased mineralization of bones in case of vitamin d deficiency which causes rickets in children and osteomalacia so if it is happening before the closure of the epiphysis it is known as rickets and if it is happening after the closure of the epiphysis it is osteomalacia so in children it is rickets and in adults the deficiency of vitamin d causes osteomalacia now let's have a look at the clinical features of rickets and another important thing is that this is important okay very important because you very frequently get asked about rickets in short notes okay so rickets is important okay now the most primary clinical feature includes bone deformities your bones becomes so soft and pliable now your weight bearing bones are bent the rosary bossy pigeon chest harrison circles okay so what is rickety rosary in rickety junction in anatomy you must have studied what is postochondral junction that is your uh, junction connection between your ribs and the postal cartilage okay now there is bossing of frontal bone this pigeon chest this harrison sulcus see your legs are bent like this in this manner so this is bow legs one of the primary features knock knees your knees are together and your feet are apart this is knock knees now you can see this is an image of rickety rosary you can see this so they appear give the appearance of the beads of a rosary hence the name rickety rosary then harrison sulcus you can see this here this here this is harrison sulcus harrison sulcus is due to your softening of ribs so that was about the clinical features of rickets now types of rickets is very important you have nutritional rickets you have renal rickets there are some other types also but these are the most important types nutritional rickets it is due to insufficient exposure to sunlight or deficiencies in vitamin d consumption occur predominantly in infants or the elderly vitamin d deficiency is more common in northern latitudes where there is less exposure to the sunlight okay so that was your nutritional rickets now renal rickets very important in kidney diseases okay when you have um, renal related diseases and your kidney is not functioning properly even a vitamin d is available calcitriol is not synthesized and you know the reason now very well why because your alpha 1 hydroxylation is taking place in the kidney so if there is some defect in the kidney or your kidney is not functioning properly it will ultimately lead to decreased level of calcitriol and what is calcitriol it is the active form of vitamin d so vitamin d will not be able to bring about its function so in case of kidney diseases also what do you have 
decreased level of calcitriol. So it responds to administration of calcitriol. So one of the primary modes of treatment is supplementation with calcitriol. Now let's take a question. A six-year-old child was brought to the hospital with complaints of slow growth and pain in bones. On examination, he was anemic, had frontal bossing, okay, bowing of legs, okay, swelling of costochondral junction. What is the likely diagnosis? You can see all the classical features of what? Rickets. So your answer will be rickets, okay? Moving on to the clinical features of osteomalacia. So, in osteomalacia, you have soft bones due to decreased mineralization and which is obviously more prone to factors because your bones are soft. So, they're more prone to factors and it takes place. Osteomalacia is in adults and it is after the closure of the epiphysis. Now, moving on to the toxicity of vitamin D. Now, excess vitamin D gets deposited in soft tissues and blood vessels, which is known as calcinosis. So, toxicity of vitamin D is known as calcinosis and what happens? There is deposition of vitamin D in soft tissues and blood vessels. So, it causes contraction of blood vessels leading to hypertension. So, this is why it is very important that you take supplements only on the recommendations of doctors and not on your own. So, popping a, a supplement is not the ultimate, uh, you know, um, solution to everything. You should always consult a doctor or physician before taking your vitamins and your supplements. It causes toxicity is seen only with supplements. See, it says your toxicity is seen only with supplements. Why? Because your excess vitamin that is formed in the skin, vitamin D that is formed in the skin, it will be inactivated by alpha by 24 hydroxylation. So your toxicity is only seen with supplements because excess vitamin D produced in the skin is converted to inactive form. So whatever excess, if the skin is producing excess vitamin D, it be converted into its inactive form. How? By 24 hydroxylation. So your toxicity is always manifested when you take supplements without recommendations. Now, what is the RDA? That is the required daily alarm. So in children, it is 10 mg per day. In adults, it is 5 to 10 mg per day. In children, obviously, it is more because it's the growing age. So they need development of teeth and bones. So the require, requirement is more in children as compared to that in adults. In pregnancy, it is 100 mg per day. So that was all about vitamin D. With this, we came to the end of the class. Thanks for watching. If you have any queries, you can ask. We had a lot of disturbance today during the class going to the network. I think the network is a little stable now. Okay, so I tried finishing the class today quickly because the network was very unstable. So I thought whatever network is coming, let me just sum it up. So any queries you can ask, I hope it's clear. And it is very important. Rickets, getting a short note on ricket is very important. Types of ricket is very important. You have end um, organ refractiveness. Uh, type is another type of rickets where your receptors in the end organs, they are not, they are abnormal or not functioning normally. Then you have um, falconry disease there. That is also a kidney related disorder. So again, there your calcitriol level is low. So you have different kinds of rickets. So types of rickets, the cl uh, clinical features of rickets, we've discussed all this. So this is important and you very frequently get asked about rickets in exam. So prepare this well. Metabolism and synthesis, you should know, uh, you can get MCQs on that, but as such, in short notes, you usually don't get that. The clinical is very important for any vitamin the diseases. Very, very, we'll study as we move forward. We'll study um, rickets we've already studied, so all these are important. 
then the functions are also important okay the action how is it brought about this is important okay so any queries you can ask and very soon from monday we'll be beginning our marathon series oriented specifically for your exams where we will only be discussing about the hot topics that you get frequently asked so with this we come to the end of the class thanks for watching thank you